Uh, as good a time to start as any. So uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this session, Metaphor in Mind, uh, Processing Digital Information and Art. Uh, my name is Igor Yudichevich. Uh, Glad to see uh, so many faces here uh, bright and early on a Sunday morning. So I'm going to do a brief intro, then we'll go through uh, the presentation, and we're going to have uh, time for a panel discussion at the end. So uh, when your questions come, make a mental note, and then uh, you'll have the chance to ask them all after the final presentation. But just to introduce what we're going to be doing today, uh, Daniel Byrne said it best, uh, why we study art, other than art is just interesting. And he mentioned that the highly variegated human activities that are classed as art form a unique testing ground that nobody interested in behavior in general can afford to ignore. So as a psychologist, studying art is just a massively useful tool and led to what I feel are some really profound uh, findings. We're going to be dealing with metaphor, so we're all familiar with linguistic metaphors. So some sentences, like this grass is green, we understand those literally, that means the grass is green. Other sentences, like he has a heart of stone, we know that that does not mean that he literally has a heart of stone, but he's emotionless, he's cold, it's metaphorical. Pictures in the same way can be metaphorical. So our first talk by Charles Jackson is going to take a look at how do we process literal information in pictures depicting motion to know that this is a picture of an individual running and how do we combine that with metaphorical information such as this multiple images to really understand uh, and perceive uh, the jumping motion in this case. Then Christopher Crawford is going to talk about how we make decisions about whether something should be interpreted metaphorically. So this runner over here, is this multiple images or is it a group of runners? So there's structural information, especially if you zoom out here, there's a guy in a baseball hat. Clearly that tells you that it's a group of individuals, not multiple images. Sometimes you get contextual information. Uh, and we're gonna see how is it that you make a decision as to whether or not this is a metaphorical example of multiple images or is this the world famous uh, BMX team doing one of their most dangerous stunts. And then we're going to end with how, does, how do metaphors spread? So we saw, the, we saw the multiple images, and that's an understood metaphor. That's something that everybody can grasp. But where did it start? And uh, maybe it spread through, and we understand it, because of Edward Moybridge and his work on uh, stop motion images. So maybe it was because he presented his images like this, and uh, if you're lucky enough to go to John Stefano's talk, you'll know all about uh, horses gates. But maybe it was because this was done first that people accepted uh, multiple metaphors. So we'll also take a look at how another metaphor spread through our understanding of visual language. So right now I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Charles Jackson for Violations of the Mode Theory, uh, Multiple Metaphors in Comic Book Art. Take it away. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Igor, for that introduction. As he said, I'm Charles Jackson. I'm going to be talking to you today about violations of the mode theory, multiple metaphors in comic book art, otherwise known as the Flash versus Quicksilver talk. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are familiar with these two, but these are the stars of our show today. So as Igor said, pictures can either be literal or they can be metaphorical, just like words. And today I'm going to be telling you about how those two combine so that you understand what's happening in a picture. So when we look at this picture, this is full of literal information. So you can see by his posture that the man is jumping, his arms are in the air, there is a ground plane. And so what we wanted to look at was how, do meta how does metaphorical information combine with that so that you understand that the man is jumping. So a metaphorical device in this case would be multiple images. How do those processes work together and combine to help you understand this better? So to do that, we have the literal additive metaphorical one and done Lamode theory. <laughs> and, and a lot of people always think of ice cream. That's a nice little touch on that. <laughs> and what this theory says is that literal information is processed additively, while metaphorical information is processed non additively. What this means is, is that when you get the first little device, that adds to your understanding of what's happening in the picture. And then, when you add more literal devices, this also adds to your uh, understanding of what's happening in the picture. Metaphorical information, on the other hand, is processed non-additively, where the first metaphor, or metaphorical device that you get 
adds to your understanding of what's happening in the picture. But adding metaphorical devices does not help your understanding of the picture, hence the one and done matter. So let's take a look at this picture of a man falling. This is a horrible picture of a man falling because you don't have literal or metaphorical information there, except for him. But what happens when you add orientation, then you add posture, and then you add ground? All three literal devices add to one another to help you understand better that this man is falling. So the one and done metaphorical piece of that is we add one metaphorical device here, action lines, and now you understand even better than you did before that the man is falling. But what happens when I add another metaphorical device, such as multiple images? This does not improve your understanding of what's happening. It doesn't make it worse, but you don't understand any better that this man is falling than you did before. So previous studies that are corpus analysis of 400 comic books where they looked at several different types of motion to see how artists would draw uh, literal and metaphorical devices. And so what you can see here on the x-axis, you have uh, one literal device, one metaphorical, two literals, three literals, one literal metaphorical, and so on. On the y-axis, you have frequency of occurrences. So the first motion that they looked at was running. And during the Poisson distribution, what they found was that this is the cutoff line. Above occurrences are preferred, below are not preferred. What they found was that if you pay attention to these pieces, this is the violation of the low theory. These are multiple metaphors. What they found was that when it came to running, artists did not prefer to use multiple metaphor devices. And this is true for falling, and flying, and you get the gist of the other motions too. There was, however, um, one motion that did violate the blue mode theory on multiple occurrences, and this came with super speed. So, let me widen that for you. What you can see is that when it came to super speed, artists preferred, to, or it looked like artists were using multiple metaphors all over the place. You can see here that there are multiple images, action lines, and blurred images that try to portray that the flash is running very fast. We can look again at another cover. I'll zoom in on that. And again, you can see multiple images, action lines, and blurred images all being portrayed for super speed. So we thought, what are the possibilities of these violations? Well, the first possibility is that the Lamo theory does not generalize to all types of motions. Maybe it does most motions, just not all types. Maybe superhuman speed is the violation. The other possibility, on the other hand, is that the super speed was mainly influenced by one artist in particular, Carmine Infantino, who was a giant in the field of drawing comic books. And he drew the flash. He was the main guy who started drawing the flash. And what you can see here, this is from comic books that he drew, where he instructed people on how to draw the flash. And what you can see is there's multiple images, there's blur, and there's action lines. So he was instructing other artists on how to draw super speed with using multiple metaphors all around. And you can even see his tag and everything there. So the other possibility is that maybe the Lamont theory does in fact generalize to all types of motions, but it could just be that violations are due to the artistic styles and influence of a famous uh, artist, Carmine Infantino. So we did a corpus analysis where we analyzed the patients of super speed to determine how Carmine Infantino measured up against other artists, and for that is where you get Quicksilver, because Quicksilver is in the Marvel Universe and he is equal, uh, yeah, he's equally as popular, and he was drawn by a variety of artists. So looking, putting those two up one against one another, uh, this here, pay attention to the x-axis. You have one, no metaphorical devices, one, two, three, four metaphorical devices. Y-axis, you have frequency of occurrences. And for a Poisson distribution for the flash, where above occurrences again are preferred, below the cutoff line is not preferred, paying close attention to the violations of the uh, Lamo theory with multiple metaphors, you can see that Carmine Infantino preferred to use 
uh, multiple metaphors when he drew the flash. Where yes, he did occur, or he did prefer to use one metaphorical device a lot, but look at how often he used two and three metaphorical devices as well. Doing the same analysis with the Quicksilver comics, paying close attention again to that, you can see that most artists preferred to use no metaphorical devices or one metaphorical device, staying clear of three and four. Now you're looking at this, this is the violation of the Lameau theory, two metaphorical devices with two occurrences happening above the cutoff line. So we wanted to take a closer look at that. We kind of thought to ourselves, okay, where are these occurrences happening? If they happen in the beginning, maybe this is just artists are learning how to draw Quicksilver. They haven't established themselves and maybe they would try it out and then it would just fade away. So we decided to do a cumulative frequency where we looked at publication date and number of occurrences of these metaphor uses. So what you can see is for no metaphors, they consistently use no metaphors throughout until the present. For one metaphor, they used it even more frequently. When it came to three and four metaphors, you can see that if they used it at all, they just didn't, they, they rarely used it. However, the thing to look at is that for the two metaphors, if you look closely, all your violations are at the very beginning of the publication date, and then you see later it fades off to where they're not using them anymore. So that kind of sticks with what we were saying, where this was used in the beginning and then they just faded off with it. They didn't like it, it didn't stick. Doing the same analysis with the flash, you can see that with no metaphors and four metaphors, Carmine Infantino never used them, but then with one, two, and three metaphorical devices, he was consistent when he started, he took a break, came back later, consistently used them time and time again. So then we wanted to do a cumulative frequency of issue serial. We wanted to see if there was a real difference in when artists were uh, drawing these. So you can look down here, this is issue serial position, frequency of occurrences for the flash and quicksilver. For no metaphors used, there is a significant difference where, the, where quicksilver is being drawn more often with no metaphors being used. For one metaphor, there is no difference uh, when artists are drawing them uh, one metaphor. Artists use them throughout the time. For two metaphors, the flash is being drawn with two metaphors significantly more often than Quicksilver is. And three metaphors drawn significantly more often with them as well. So what this tells us is that maybe we were right with possibly number two. The violations do appear to be more of an influential uh, characteristic of Carmine Infantino. So what this means for art research, the Lameau theory could provide a framework for investigating the use of metaphors in any art style or media. It could be movies, cartoons, anything where metaphors are used. And for artists, this Lameau theory provides a guide for efficient depictions where you can minimize the information that you're using while maximizing the information that is communicated. Thank you. The end. So hold on to your questions and up next we are going to uh, continue our look at metaphors with Christopher Crawford. So understanding metaphor and art distinguishing literal giants from metaphorical challenges. Christopher, it's all yours. <coughs> Information. 
um, two heuristic frameworks that not only describe how pictorial metaphors are apprehended and interpreted, but also how artists use pictorial metaphors. Um, and those frameworks, the contextual framework is a synthesis of information, sorry, of uh, theories from fine science um, and the structural framework is a synthesis of uh, extant research from Forceville and Fang out on the road. Um, the contextual framework proposes that the apprehension and interpretation of pictorial metaphor is contextually determined, uh, therefore depending upon the culture in which the art arises, uh, societal norms and standards, and also the larger body of extant works from the artist, um, such as canon. Um, then the structural framework uh, <coughs> proposes that the apprehension and interpretation of pictorial metaphor is structurally determined, therefore all of the elements necessary to apprehend and interpret an image are contained within the image itself, based upon structure um, and the visual framework. So that it's important that pictorial devices, I'm sorry, <laughs> so what we wanted to do thereafter uh, was actually to look at a large sample of uh, pieces of art from art history, um, do a corpus analysis analyzing works of art to determine the ways in which artists combine contextual and structural information. Um, and to do that, we had a few challenges. The first being to pick a pictorial device that's used both literally and metaphorically. Um, so uh, based on previous re research that we had done, uh, we chose exaggerated size. Uh, exaggerated size is something that's used comically, but <laughs> commonly in either regard, both in comics and other uh, artistic works. So here, for example, we have a, a literal use of exaggerated size here with the giant Batman. Uh, but then also it's common to uh, exaggerate the depiction to represent power or menace. So here we have a metaphorical use of exaggerated size, but once again with the Batman figure. Um, so as you can see, it's the same device used literally and metaphorically. So uh, the second, after we had chosen our pictorial device, the next challenge was actually to define it operationally. Um, and to that end, uh, we decided that we would define exaggerated size as being 150% of normal height. Um, and that can be determined either relative to other humans, other human figures, as we see here uh, with Saturn devouring his son from Francisco de Goya. The figure in the background is substantially larger uh, than what he's holding. Um, here's another example uh, of hierarchical scaling where the Madonna in the center uh, is exaggerated in her size to pick uh, her power, her, her importance. Um, but when there is not another figure to relate it to, uh, we thought we would also go with the horizon ratio relation. Um, the horizon line indicates the eye height of the viewer. So anything that extends above that is necessarily larger than the viewer. So here we have an example of uh, exaggerated size with the horizon ratio relation. Um, and the Temptation of St. Anthony from Salvador Dali. Uh, in the foreground, we see St. Anthony himself. He is cut off uh, at the horizon line, uh, rather the horizon line cuts him off at the chest uh, while he is kneeling, uh, meaning he is substantially uh, larger than normal height. Um, and here we have uh, the Colossus again from Francisco de Goya, uh, where both the relation to other humans in the foreground and the horizon ratio itself cues that he is quite large. All right, so uh, after we had determined what pictorial device we wanted to use and come up with a working definition, um, the next challenge was actually to find a sample of images that contain exaggerated size. Uh, for that, we went to famouspaintings.com. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a retail website um, that sells prints of uh, various, uh, sorry, various genres, various epochs. Um, and what we liked about this was that these were images that were chosen by popular demand. Um, so here are just some examples um, of uh, uh, things in their top 1,000. Um, and so from that, we looked at all 1,000 images. We found a subset of 59 that used uh, the pictorial device that exaggerated size. Um, and here are some of those images. So again, Saturn devouring his son. It's a heartwarming classic. <laughs> uh, we have the Son of Man from Rene Marguerite, uh, Colossus, one of our personal favorites, uh, Reflection with Two Children, uh, etc., etc. So here um, in each one, you can see uh, either due to the horizon line 
or due to other figures, um, it's cued that exaggerated size is used uh, structurally or metaphorically. So that was quite a lot that we went through. <laughs> um, so from there, um, what we did was we categorized all of these uh, based on the interpretations of the structural frameworks and the contextual framework. Um, so the structural framework arrives in metaphorical uh, can either arrive at a metaphorical or a literal uh, depiction, um, interpretation, rather. <laughs> the contextual framework can similarly land at either a literal or a metaphorical interpretation, uh, giving us four categories for classification. So here we have uh, um, just some exemplars for each of those. So here in the bottom left quadrant, you see an image that the context cues a literal interpretation um, and the structure cues a literal interpretation. Uh, going to the top right, we have an image where there we are. Um, the structure of the image as well as the context of the image cue a metaphorical interpretation. Uh, moving to the bottom right quadrant, we have slowly but surely um, an image where the context cues a metaphorical interpretation and the structure cues a literal interpretation. And then lastly, an image where the structure cues a metaphorical inter interpretation and the context cues a literal interpretation. So based on those categorizations, uh, we also wanted to look at uh, frequency. So here, uh, frequency is on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have those categorizations based on the interpretations of the frameworks. So first, uh, where the contextual and structural frameworks arrive at a concordant literal interpretation, then where the context indicates a literal interpretation and a structure interpret uh, indicates a metaphorical interpretation, and contextual, metaphorical, structural, literal, and in English, a contextual and structural concordant metaphorical interpretation. And these are just the exemplars uh, that we used in the last orthogonal. So what we did from there was a cumulative Poisson distribution um, to indicate preference uh, of well, artistic preference and uh, occurrence being uh, average or above or below. Um, what we found was that using concordant contextual and structural information to cue a liberal interpretation was preferred, as was concordant contextual and structural metaphorical information. Um, contextual, uh, metaphorical, and structural literal information was also a preferred combination, but surprisingly, uh, contextual literal information and structural metaphorical information was highly unpreferred. So, from that, we were able to conclude that our minds prefer contextual information over structural information, and that our minds prefer metaphorical interpretations over literal. So, going back to our uh, exemplars here from each of these categories, I'll describe what that means a little clearer. Um, so, for this image here, um, we have the results of the interpretation from the contextual uh, and the structural uh, frameworks. So here the context indicates a literal interpretation. And the structure also indicates a literal interpretation. Um, though our mind prefers context over structure, since they both arrive at concordant interpretations, we would conclude that this is a literal image. So here. We have an image where the context indicates that this is a metaphorical image, um, and the structure similarly indicates that this is a metaphorical image. Um, since our mind prefers uh, context over structure, uh, even though it's concordant, we would arrive at a uh, metaphorical interpretation of the image. Um, but the frameworks don't always agree. So here we have an example where the context indicates a metaphorical interpretation and the structure uh, the image indicates a literal interpretation. Our mind prefers the context over the structure um, and a metaphorical interpretation over a literal interpretation. So then the metaphorical interpretation is more heavily weighed, resulting in a conclusion that it's a metaphorical image. So then when we have, uh, on the opposite end, the least preferred category, <coughs> where the context indicates that the image should be interpreted literally, but the structure interprets uh, proposes that the image should be interpreted metaphorically. Uh, we have our minds preferring the context um, and simultaneously preferring a metaphorical interpretation, resulting in an image that is confusing. 
So just again, that's the reason that uh, to, to use uh, contextual liberal information and structural metaphorical information is uh, less common. So what does this mean for art research and for artists? Uh, we think that the contextual and structural frameworks can be applied to investigating the use of art in any art style immediate. Um, and we believe that it could be used as a guide for combining literal and metaphorical information, uh, whether the goal is ease of communication or to intentionally challenge the viewer. All right. Okay, so once again, if you have any questions, we will have time at the end to um, answer all of those. And now, finally, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, me, uh, to the stage. So we're going to take a look at the adoption of metaphor in comic book art, uh, specifically the metaphor close-up eye asymmetry. Now, usually I do my thank yous um, at the end. Uh, this time, though, I really feel compelled. I got to do it at the beginning just to give you a little bit of context. So my talk is going to involve David Bowie. David Bowie uh, was a kind of personal hero to me. Died on January uh, 10th, 2016, and as a result of that, the Comics uh, Grid um, peer-reviewed scholarship of comics put out a special call for papers on David Bowie and comic book research. So literally, two of my favorite things in the world. However. At that time, I was kind of needy, not only in my uh, tenure clock, but also I was struggling with depression. Uh, it took its toll, not very productive in my first few years. It got better, but uh, at the time, uh, I really had to make decisions about the research that I engaged in. And this research was high risk. So completely new to me, was I going to find anything? Uh, even if I did find something, was it going to be you know, accepted? Were people going to be uh, impressed? So whenever I have a tough decision like this and I don't know what to do, uh, ask my wife Raquel. And uh, she looked me in the eye and she goes, Igor, you have to do this. So I just want to thank her. This presentation would not exist without uh, her. All right, so on to the actual research. So we're going to be talking about close-up eye asymmetry. So this is a metaphorical device that communicates both the concepts of alien and human. And I'm going to show that it is a lexical item in comic book visual language. And then I'm going to provide evidence that will hopefully convince you that it became a lexical item because of the cover image for Aladdin Sane. So I am no way trying to argue that this was the first time somebody did close-up body asymmetry. But what I'm going to argue is that this was the moment when it became incorporated and then spread through that uh, comic book visual language. So close-up eye asymmetry, uh, it's kind of there in the name. Uh, first off, you have a close personal distance. And according to visual grammar, this says that the person being depicted is like you. It's like the viewer. So this communicates that Bowie, in this case, is human rather than alien. So he's like us, like the viewer. However, the asymmetry communicates the exact opposite. It communicates that he's not like the viewer, that he's alien, uh, because most things have bilateral symmetry. So together, uh, this one combination, this one metaphor, can communicate both the human and the alien, both the message that this person is like us, and yet somehow unlike us. So that's the metaphorical device of uh, QA. Uh, and then uh, close-up eye asymmetry is a lexical item in comic book visual language. So here we have a comic book character, character Peter Stanchek. Uh, he has vast psionic powers, so much so you can see it leaking out of his eyes. And yet on this cover, the artist decided to communicate like us, but not like us. So close up and asymmetry uh, around the eye. There's no reason the other eye shouldn't be lit up except to communicate that idea. And this is found in comic books over and over again. So here we have Magneto, same device, Storm, same device. You can do it with powers, you can do it with light and shading, you can do it with the composition and placement of images, uh, and it's done in mainstream comics, um, independent comics. You could do it with montage. So once again, this soldier here could have been placed anywhere, but deliberately uh, over the eye to create that asymmetry. This is actually a rare case of the double eye asymmetry, because you also have stars just on one side. But again, montage can be used. 
to create this close up eye asymmetry. And comic book artists were well aware of this. So this is an image of Cable, he was in the new Deadpool 2 movie, originally created by a very influential artist, Rob Liefeld. Influential but not necessarily liked by everyone, because this other influential artist, Alex Ross, uh, was quoted as saying, the design of Cable, I hated it. The scars, the thing going on with his eye, the arm, and what's with all the guns. So they were aware of this eye asymmetry, this device that could communicate um, whether they were aware that it communicated human and alien, we don't know, but they were aware of its use. So it's a lexical item in comic book visual language. And now the last thing that I'm gonna go through is that it became this lexical item, it spread through comic book visual language <coughs> due to that specific cover of uh, Aladdin Saint. So to do this, uh, I'm going to uh, present two lines uh, of evidence, but first we need to establish a few things. Uh, specifically, uh, one thing that will make this more likely. So I'm going to provide evidence. I'm hoping to heap convincing evidence on top of convincing evidence. And the first thing we want to take a look at is, was David Bowie familiar with comic book visual language? You are much more likely to make a contribution to a language if you understand how that language actually works. <laughs> so for this, we have to keep in mind that Aladdin scene was released April 1973. So that's when this image was released onto the public. And we know, thankfully, from the exhibit David Bowie is, what David Bowie's top 100 books, uh, his favorite books were. So he was an avid reader, and among those books that came out before the cover for Aladdin Sane, before he cre created this image, among his top 100 was included the Beano, uh, a, a comic book from the 60s, uh, Octo Brianna and the Russian Underground, uh, independent comic book, and also the magazine Private Eye, which wasn't a comic book, but had covers that utilized that comic book language, like sequential images and um, uh, word bubbles. So David Bowie was familiar with comic book language. Uh, the next thing we're going to ask is, are comic book artists influenced by music album art? Right? This is low-hanging fruit. Um, but again, were they even looking in that direction for inspiration? And it's very, once again, we can just use an existence proof. So any guesses? <laughs> the Beatles. The Beatles, so this is Abbey Road. Um, this is Paul McCartney and the Wings, Band on the Run. And uh, hopefully everybody will recognize <laughs> Aladdin Saint. So comic book artists were looking for inspiration in uh, music art. Uh, and that, again, we totally expected. So now the last and most challenging aspect of this was the use of QA due to the cover of Aladdin Sane. So we're going to go through two lines of converging evidence. Line number one is going to be a logical progression. It's going to start with the release date of Aladdin Sane, follow it up to whether or not David Bowie was influencing popular culture at the time, follow that up with the stage of artistic development, follow that up with the ages at which artists are typically reaching their peak creativity, and this will be the culmination of that first line. So once again, Aladdin Sane released April 1973. Was David Bowie influencing American culture at that time? Well, this was his sixth studio album. Three of those were in the Billboard Top uh, 40 uh, during their releases. A documentary and concert film on him was just um, uh, broadcast on uh, ABC. 1973 documentary. So if we can all remember back when there were three channels, uh, this was a major um, uh, way to get it out to popular media. So definitely he was having an influence. People knew uh, who David Bowie was. What about artistic development? Well, around the ages of 9 to 13 years uh, old, when, when uh, children are starting to draw, they're becoming artists, um, this is a period where developing artists are most open to outside influences. This is where they start to look elsewhere and say, how can I make my art uh, better? And oftentimes around this age, they'll have what's known as a crystallizing experience. They see something, they experience something, and they're like, yes, like this is what I is going to do with my artistic uh, direction. This is what I want to um, look like. So we have that crystallizing experience, 9 to 13 years of age. And then finally, we have the uh, finding that artists typically reach their peak creative output at approximately 29 uh, years of age, right? So around that 20 to 30s years where 
They're usually their most prolific, usually their most productive. Put that all together, and we have the idea that a child that was between the ages of 9 and 13, when Aladdin Sane was released, would reach their peak creative output 15 to 19 years later, when they were approximately 29 years old. 15 to 19 years later is the 90s. So we should see very influential artists in the 90s using this um, uh, close-up eye asymmetry. And when we take a look at the top, top, top artists of the 90s, we got Rob Liefeld, six years when the uh, album came out, 20 to 30 when, uh, when the 90s hit. We got Adam Hughes, 20 to 30 when the 90s hit. We got Jim Lee, who is an absolute giant, 20 to 25 to 35 when the 90s hit. So again, in the right development stage when Aladdin Sane was released, hit their peak crea uh, creative output in the 90s, and these are all very kind of um, stereotypical images that you would see in 90s comic books. We got Todd McFarlane uh, with uh, Spawn Comics. We got Mark Silvestri. We got uh, Frank Miller. Again, all near that critical developmental period where an experience like this could be a crystallizing experience and all the right age in the 90s for that uh, uh, creative peak output. All right, so line number two uh, brings back the idea of the uh, graphic schemas that Charles mentioned before. So a graphic schema, you can think of it as a sort of established way that you're going to draw things in comic book. It's almost like a saying in our uh, verbal language. So it's kind of like an accepted, established way that things will be drawn in comics. And the second line of evidence uses the idea that if the cover for Aladdin Sane was responsible for this spread of QA into comic book visual language, then any character that was well established with graphic schemas before the release should be resistant to accepting any change in their graphic schemas. But characters released after, or uh, drawn after the release, they have new graphic schemas that could be easily influenced and incorporate this close-up eye asymmetry. So once again, Aladdin Sane, released April 1973. Super easy to find, extremely well-known uh, characters that were established before that time. And you can just uh, go to Superman in 1938, Batman, first appearance 1939, Wonder Woman, known as the Trinity uh, for DC. So those are the ones that would have had well-established ways of being drawn, graphic schemas, when Aladdin Sane was released. On the other hand, popular characters that were released after that date include Golgo 13, and this is the fifth highest selling manga in the world, so it was really nice to find an international uh, example. And then here in America, we have The Punisher, massively popular, and Wolverine, hugely popular, all coming out after uh, Aladdin Sane was released. So we took a look at their uh, cumulative distributions um, on a publication date here. Right there is where Aladdin Sane uh, came out. And when you take a look at the cumulative distributions for the characters that came out before Aladdin Sane and see how often they were using this close-up eye asymmetry, that's the cumulative distribution right there. So if there was resistance in adopting close-up eye asymmetry here, we should see a much higher line for the ones that came out after Aladdin Sane. And sure enough, there it is, and it is whoppingly significant. So once again, we see that these graphic schemas were much more accepting and much more influenced by close-up asymmetry. And also, interestingly, check out where that inflection point is. It's when those artists who were 9 to 13 reached the ages of 20 to 30. That's when it all of a sudden took off. All right, so uh, that's the second line. So again, two converging lines of evidence that indicate that this close-up eye asymmetry that communicates both alien and uh, human, both like us and not like us, may not have been invented by David Bowie, but the, uh, can be traced back, his incorporation into the language can be traced back to this single image on the cover of Aladdin Sane. All right, so uh, this uh, for art research um, gives you uh, hopefully new insight into the development of our visual languages. So, uh, and this analysis, uh, looking for those critical periods doing the cumulative frequency analysis can again apply uh, to any art style, any media, and then for all the artists out there, um, it's, it's interesting to see that 
if you do invent a new metaphor, if you are in your studio and you go, ah, this is amazing. I love this new metaphor. Nobody's ever done it. It will be adopted much more quickly by the audience if you also invent new graphic schemas to go along with it. So don't paint the old in your new metaphorical style. Paint the new in the new metaphorical style, and that's much more likely to, um, to spread. All right. I was worried, but not anymore. We got eight minutes for questions. So questions for the panel. And I'd like to call Christopher and Charles back up here and uh, open the floor. Yes. Uh, this is for Charles Jackson. Um, yeah, I like I like what you did with the um, single metaphorical um, uh, idea. Uh, I I'm, I guess I'm questioning though the, what what you think of as the difference between the literal and the metaphorical. So we take your example of a person falling. If we added hair to that image. It seems like according to your theory, that would be adding information. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but it doesn't seem like it has any information to the idea of falling. Well, it, that would depend on the orientation or the movement of the hair. So, say you had a person falling and they were upside down. Well, if the hair is not moving backwards, maybe you're thinking they had a lot of gel on that day or something. Right? Okay. okay. Let's yeah. take let's take shirt color. Okay. Or something something that's not related to falling, right? Mm. So it seems like. If, if, the, if the, the thing we're talking about is falling, certain literal things will be relevant and others will be irrelevant. Yeah, but it's the literal device that's adding to falling. Well, if I yeah, if I if I may, um, your your question is really interesting. This is something that we struggled with. How do we define literal versus metaphorical? So we went, actually, we used John Kennedy's um, definition, at least I hope we used it, right? <laughs> and uh, if something in the picture is depicting something that literally occurred in the real world, so if it actually occurs no, in the real world. The oh, okay. Well, that's our definition. Yeah, I know. Okay. I, I'm just saying, like, if, if they were falling and thinking, oh, no, with a thought balloon, yep. that's two metaphorical images, but they do it. The second one does add something. Oh, okay. Right? So, so it matters, like... Yes, absolutely. Um, our choice of the devices, I think, is what you're trying to get at. Uh, we used Corello et al.'s devices that they had done with previous work. So that's why we had posture, orientation, and uh, the ground plane. That's why we had action lines and uh, metaphoric uh, multiple images, because those are the ones that they used when they initially did this, uh, did research on uh, how those, uh, what information is presented in those. So um, we looked at how they were specifically combined. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the choice of what do you include in the analysis is a very important one. And uh, thankfully for our research, you know, because it's always wonderful when the next one works out, when we extended it to additional metaphorical devices like we did with the flash study, it's the same findings every single time. So um, in uh, the short answer is that we just outsourced it to another researcher <laughs> and said, what do you think we should include? Uh, yes. So first of all, I want to congratulate all three of you for having among the most beautiful and attractive slides in the show. <laughs> so it's nice having people who think about visual design and other presenting this. Um, so my question is really about a, 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 a notion that's prominent in linguistic metaphor and, and the way in which this applies to your research. Because all three of you talk about historical progression in various uh, kinds of devices that are used. And one thing that's been clear in people who study linguistic metaphor is that not all metaphors are the same. Uh, and there's, there's this notion of the career of metaphor where metaphors can start out the first few times they're used, they're, uh, they perform a different kind of function, which is it allows you to grapple with a new construct, a new concept by, by uh, clothing it with old familiar uh, forms. But the goal there is to actually um, is to uh, have an emerging idea uh, brought to the surface, as opposed to when linguistic metaphors get used uh, over time, they become conventionalized, uh, and there it becomes an efficiency of communication, eventually to becoming dead metaphors where people don't even realize that they're metaphors. So if I say, did you get this uh, abstract in by the deadline? Deadline itself is a metaphor, but most people here are unlikely to know what the source of that metaphor and so the question is, is something similar happening in these, <laughs> over the temporal duration of these devices, where they start out initially actually communicating something that has not been communicated before, so there's an, an innovation piece to it 
Then there becomes an efficiency of communication piece, and eventually people stop seeing them as metaphors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, the and it's part of the reason why we we usually break it down in terms of what's the timeline, where's the cumulative frequency, and I think we actually saw a little bit of what you're referring to when we took a look at the Quicksilver uh, data with the multiple um, metaphors being used early, and we didn't have examples of those images, but they're they're not good and they really don't work. So um, there, uh, it would be it would be super interesting to uh, do this kind of an analysis and see, um, you know, were other metaphors used and abandoned? You know, which ones kind of made it through to this part where they're uh, accepted? But we definitely did want that ease of communication. Um, and that's why we chose popular artworks. That's why we chose comic books, because those are the artworks where people looked at them and said, I get it. You know, I'm not really struggling. I want this in my room. Uh, or if you're a little child opening up a comic book, uh, you're not going to want to be confused as to what Superman is doing. You want to understand it. So definitely, I think our work um, stayed in that established area that you were talking about. And it would absolutely be just fascinating to go back as far as we can. And actually, uh, maybe two years later, hopefully, uh, currently, one of the uh, students in my lab is we're going all the way back to cave art and we're trying to apply this to, you know, did they use uh, metaphors? And I don't think we can go further back than that, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We'll see what it uh, what happens. Yes. I also I'm very impressed by this research. Um, but I have another aspect I want to ask. Um, mm -hmm. It seems that this comic art research offers a unique opportunity to have a focus of the material. So, so that's uh, that's wonderful. And only during your presentation I became more and more aware. However, I wonder when you show us frequency, are these frequencies gathered from the complete set of these, I don't know any of these comic books, but uh, of these series, or is it is it a selection of the material that you've chosen to demonstrate the frequency of the Yes, it's it's always a, um, a question of how, how do you select your sample? We want to make it representative. We uh, So things we considered, we want it representative. We don't want it influenced by a single artist unless we're specifically looking at the influence of a single artist. So what we typically do is we typically would pick a time period and we say, all right, we're going to take a look at these popular characters or these popular titles from 1970 to 1985. And we look at however many hundred or thousands of images those are. And then we look for the metaphors that we're looking for. So for um, exaggerated size, which ones have exaggerated size? For close-up asymmetry, which ones are doing that? Um, and the ones that we get the most of is definitely motion, which is what initially led us into the comic book realm because comics are all about action. People are moving all the time. And we were just like, this is, this is a gold mine of uh, potential analysis. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's a schematic, collectively speaking, it's a schematic device, a metaphor. So if you have lines after a figure, you can find motion as a different kind of critter mm -hmm. than the Madonna in a context where there's a very big size it. It's going to very big size it and imply greatness. Whereas the Q lines from the schematic device imply motion with different kinds of implication. One is direct, it's moving, and the other has more quiet, uh, implicit effects. Um, again, this is, uh, I'll just say, uh, before I answer that question, this is why I absolutely adore this conference. I do not get questions like this at a general conference. But to answer your, your question, um, I would say the, the short answer is at this point, we're not sure. We don't know. Um, but definitely those both fall under our definition of what a metaphorical device is. And uh, are there subsets to that? Absolutely. Um, I actually was not even thinking along those lines uh, until you said schematic versus more conceptual. Um, but uh, I think it would be one of the first things I do when I get back to my lab. But yeah, I mean, there are, there are ones where it's definitely tied into your experience in the world, right? So larger things tend to be more powerful so we can understand how that gets adopted as you know, power and importance in a, um, uh, in an image. 
Are action lines schematic? You know, are they, uh, this is a huge question. Are they just convention? Did somebody just say, let's come up with this and that's the way that it works? There have been studies that have been done where um, they've uh, computer modeled uh, human vision. They've shown uh, motion in front of this computer model and then seeing how it represents and what sort of channels it creates to address that motion. And they found just by putting motion in front of a uh, in front of this computer program, it actually developed uh, sensors and receptors that looked for action lines. So it could just be an outcrop of our experience in the real world. It could just be an artist that said, let me try this and ooh, that's really good. And then shows it to his wife and says, what do you think? And she's like, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, they're definitely, I'm glad you brought that up. There is a distinction between the two that we could totally look into. Yep. The second thing I'm doing when I get back to the lab. Do we have do we have time? I know it's yeah. All right, so two more, I guess. Um, is there a direct relation between the sort of QA uh, that you've been analyzing and the popularity, the uh, purchasing power, the behavior of purchase from audiences? Like, do you find that particular covers um, that might incorporate QA actually improve sales, or do you have that type of uh, behavioral data to accompany the data that um, we do not have that um, data to uh, uh, to back up that claim. Um, I would say my guess would be, and I'll speculate on this. My guess would be absolutely yes, because during the '90s, during uh, when this kind of exploded and everybody was using this uh, this close-up eye symmetry, that was a time when the comic book industry was absolutely booming. That was a time when people were um, you know, buying comics to uh, later sell, to sell, you know, put their kids through college. Um, spoiler alert, none of it worked. Um, but the sales were just ginormous at that time. So the fact that the QA asymmetry was used so often in the 90s at the time when the sales were massive, uh, I would have to say that that points towards, yes, they did have an impact as people were looking at this. And again, you know, not knowing maybe exactly what it is, kind of like when you look at a piece of art and you're like, I don't know, I'm feeling something, but I don't know exactly what it is. It would be very interesting to see and experimentally do subjects understand alien versus human. But if it was used in comics uh, during the 90s, especially when sales were, were king, you definitely know that the average person was looking at this going, something about this one, that's what I'm picking up. It definitely caught the eye. Stefano, you had one? Uh, thank you. Uh, it was very interesting. And at the end, you tried to combine to give some advice to the viewer and, and to artists. In your example on the size and exaggeration of the size, mm -hmm. probably it was not the intention of artists to give the exaggeration of the size to be used as a metaphor, as a metaphor, no? to understand the picture and to grasp the meaning of the picture. In the example you gave in The Majesty by Duccio, Probably it was the beginning of the perspective, the creation of perspective. It probably was not the intention of the artist to give that over the standards on the side. Probably it was not easy to combine all different sizes. Or in Madrid, this really started, the art style was different in terms of the meaning of the side. But the viewer can grasp other meaning that goes beyond the intention of the artist. Do you think that can be? Oh yeah, I think I think it's absolutely, um, and I would I would love to be able to uh, find out more about the intention of the artist. Definitely, like art history and what sort of period they're in and what sort of the uh, conventions were at the time would be very helpful for that. Um, you know, but it's very difficult to ask artists what what were you doing, especially with the cave art. I mean, that's you know. <laughs> but um, one of the things that's also always kind of fascinating along fascinated me along that idea 
is whether or not the artists who use these metaphors even knew that they were using the metaphor. So was it just something that they found pleasing? Was it something that they just found created this effect? So for our research, whether or not they sat there and they said, you know what, I want this to look important. So I'm going to draw the horizon ratio cut in St. Anthony right there. All right. And I know perspective and I know geometry that's going to make it giant and that's going to make him seem important. Or was Salvador Dali just there and he said, you know what? I like this layout. I think it looks cool. Something about it. It's just telling me it works. So we're going to do that. So that's a very interesting question. And uh, maybe the third thing I'll be doing <laughs> when I get back to my lab. But um, I think uh, for the end result, however, um, either or is, is uh, acceptable, right? Whether they knew it and were using it or whether they just felt it and used it. Still, the final analysis is they use some combinations, they don't use others. Um, some get incorporated, some don't. So um, we sidestep that as much as we can because it's very difficult. All right, I think that is it. Thank you so much uh, for coming and uh, I'm extremely glad to be here.